Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, on, on Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, a program where we go through the writings of the church. And today we are continuing through the great uh, doc, uh, encyclical, Fides et Ratio. Now this is by Blessed John Paul II. <clears throat> and you can get a paperback edition of it by going to EWTN's Religious Catalog. Uh, it's just EWTNReligiousCatalog.com or you can call them up 1-800-854-6316. And if you would prefer, you can get a free electronic copy of Fides at Ratio over at our document library. Go to EWTN.com Click the Faith tab, you'll see libraries, go to Document Library, type in Fides et Ratio, and it'll come up and you can highlight it and download it into your computer the way I did. Now, of course, we want you to get involved and participate in our show. One, you can do like these nice folks have done, just to come here to Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, another, you can send us a question by writing to Threshold at EWTN.com, or you can call us during our live broadcast, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number here is 1-800-221-9460. Or you can also call 205-271-2988. We've begun chapter four of this document, which is entitled The Relationship Between Faith and Reason. And the Pope already laid out in paragraph 37 that he wants to go through some of the history of the relationship between faith and reason in the history of the church. And paragraph 38 begins that Christianity's engagement with philosophy was neither straightforward nor immediate. The, the Jewish apostles wouldn't know any philosophy as we know it. They, they maybe, uh, as a matter of fact, probably Andrew and maybe Philip knew Greek, at least to speak. But as fishermen, they didn't have a lot of time to study. The only one in the early church who seems to have known some philosophy was St. Paul, who grew up in Tarsus, he was born in Tarsus, and partly raised in Jerusalem. Tarsus was a famous uh, place for scholarship, uh, sort of a college town. And he shows, when he goes to Athens, that he's aware of some Greek philosophy. But the other apostles were not, and it didn't come into play much in the early church. The practice of philosophy and the attendance at philosophical schools uh, seem more of a disturbance than an opportunity for the cr first Christians. They had more of an urgency to proclaim the gospel right away rather than go back and study. That wasn't their concern. <coughs> That's why he says the first and most important task was the proclamation of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and to call people to a personal encounter with Christ so that the listener could have a conversion of heart and then request baptism into Jesus so they could have that union with him in baptism. That was their main task and that's very understandable and we need to be about that too. Philosophy does not save you. Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. But as we've been saying throughout this whole series, philosophy is a tool. Now, that does not mean that they completely ignored the task of deepening their understanding of faith and its motivations. They did want to go more deeply into what does the faith mean? And why should we be motivated against 
Um, and that was quite, quite the opposite was true. Uh, you do have the criticism of Celsus. Celsus was a pagan who wrote a book against the Christians. And he was pretty strongly anti-Christian. Uh, we don't have his book, but we do have quotations from his book. From Origen. Origen was a priest originally from Alexandria. Later he studied at Caesarea Maritima by the sea. And he wrote a book against Celsus. You can still get that at our documents website. It's called Contra Celsum. And in book 3, chapter 55, he quotes Celsus, who asserts, and I quote, We see indeed in private houses persons of the most uninstructed and rustic character not venturing to utter a word in the presence of their elders and wiser masters. But when they get hold of the children privately, and certainly women as ignorant as themselves, they pour forth wonderful statements to the effect that they ought not to give heed to their father and to their teachers, but should obey them. That the former are foolish and stupid, and neither know nor can perform anything that is really good. Now, that description of the Christians is not complimentary. <laughs> and he, he thought of them uh, as completely un uncouth. Now, this was not true because, in fact, Origen, who answered Celsus, was himself quite educated, not only in Greek and Latin, but also in Hebrew. He probably knew a number more languages and was careful in their use as best he could be with what he had available, much more so than Celsus would have been. Now, of course, Celsus does certainly seem to echo something that the high priests had said when they arrested Peter and John and called them uninstructed and ignorant. Uh, so, so this seems to be a common thing. But um, instead of seeing that they're stupid, that wasn't the reason that they were uninstructed in philosophy. We have to look for another explanation of why they didn't know philosophy. That the encounter with the gospel of Jesus Christ offered such a satisfying answer to the unresolved question of the meaning of life, that delving into the philosophers seemed to be something remote, and to the early Christians, the philosophers seemed outmoded. See, the philosophers at this time were of three main schools. There were other schools, but you had the Stoics, the Epicureans, and the Neoplatonists. Especially, you see the Neoplatonists in um, uh, Alexandria, while the uh, Stoics and Epicureans were more common in Greece and elsewhere, in Rome too. And so um, they, they were trying to figure out, you know, what is that? that they're more focusing on questions. And the early Christians said, well, Jesus answers the meaning of life and the meaning of human existence. So we're going to stick with him. That seems, as a matter of fact, that reminds me of Mother Angelica's book. You know, uh, uh, answers, not promises. You know, she, you know that, that, that was the attitude of the early Christians. And that seems still more evident today. If we think of Christianity's contribution to the idea that, uh, of the right of everyone to have access to the truth. Christians have been very committed from the earliest days to giving access to the truth to as many people as possible. That is why the monks copied all the ancient books, the philosophy books, the literature books, history books, law books, everything. 
They were interested in uh, copying Ptolemy, the astronomer, the various mathematicians, the medical texts. And the copies that we have are primarily from monks. Some people say, well, it's from the Arabs, isn't it? No, the Arabs were themselves pretty much illiterates. They got the Greek philosophers from the Syriac monks of Iraq, Syria, and other areas in the region, because they copied down those books at Antioch and elsewhere. So, you know, the Christians um, were very much interested in giving everybody access to the truth, and they taught as many people as they could, given the limitations of the times. And Christianity dismantled barriers of race, social status, and gender, so that you see the early uh, monasteries that flourished in Ireland included women's convents, where the women also learned to read and write, something pretty rare in Roman society. And also, it didn't matter what ethnic group you belonged to. You see Christians from all over the world engaging in studies. And when the Irish, for instance, accepted monasticism after St. Patrick converted them, you see that they wanted books not only in Latin, but in Greek and Coptic and Hebrew. They wanted to learn everything. So Christianity proclaimed from the first the equality of all men and women before God, and all have a right to learn. One primary implication of this touched the theme of truth. The ancient people had a certain elitism about the search for truth. So for instance, even one of the greatest of the philosophers, Plato, believed that women were inherently too inferior to be able to learn. That's why he believed men could not be friends with women, because they were not the equals of the men, and they couldn't learn as well as men. So uh, that's a good example of elitism. And the Christians abandoned that since access to the truth enables access to God. The church wants everyone to have access to God and therefore access to the truth. You can't deny it to anybody. There are many paths which lead to truth, but since Christian truth has a value for the salvation of souls, that's what's at stake with the issue of the truth that the salvation of the soul is at stake. And therefore, uh, Christian truth uh, has this value. Any of the paths can be taken so long as it leads to the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you can use Plato or Stoic ideas or um, uh, Aristotle. Now, they'll find it more difficult to use the Epicureans, and even the Stoics had limits. But if something leads you to understand Christ and his revelation better, you can use it. Now, one, one of the first pioneers among Christians to engage philosophy, though he did it with a very careful discernment, was St. Justin Martyr. St. Justin was born in the city of Neapolis. Neapolis was, or is still a city, in what's now the West Bank of the Palestinian Authority. But you can still hear the old name, Neapolis, in the, the modern name, Nablus, Nablus, N-A-B-L-U-S. And it's a city I've been to a number of times. And in fact, the Grand Mosque of Nablus is built over the site of the ancient church of St. Justin Martyr, probably the, the, the church 
marking the place where he was born. That's what I suspect, because he died in Rome, not there. Now, he was born there. His father was a Roman soldier. He was born in Neapolis, or Nablus. And he went all, what's, all through the cities of what's now the kingdom of Jordan, and went uh, 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 like Jarash. Uh, today, you can still go to Jarash. Great, great ruins to see one of the best Roman ruins in the world. And I went to other cities, learning as much philosophy as he could, anywhere he could study it. Obviously, he had some, some financial backing from his family. And he continued to hold Greek philosophy in high esteem, even after he found Christ. Because he found that I've been searching for the answer. It's in Jesus Christ that I found it. And he said with, with great power and clarity that he found the real philosophy in Christianity. There's a great book uh, you can get again from our website. It's called Dialogue with Trifo by St. Justin Martyr. Go to our documents library. You can download the whole thing. And in chapter 8, section 1, it says, when Trifo had spoken these things and many other things, which there's no time for mentioning at present here, he went away, bidding me, that is just a martyr, to attend to them. And I have not seen him since, but straightway a flame was kindled in my soul and a love of the prophets and of those men who are friends of Christ possessed me. And while revolving his words in my mouth, my, in my mind, I found this philosophy, Christianity, alone to be safe and profitable. That was, and, and he talked about uh, Christianity as a philosophy. I really don't think they had yet invented the word theology. So they just called it all philosophy. Similarly, uh, uh, now, St. Justin Martyr was writing that, I think, in the 140s A.D. By the way, he also is somebody who mentions that he knew personally some elderly women who had been baptized by the apostles. Now, he knew them in the 130s or 140s, and the apostles were dying off by the 60s and 70s. So, that's a little small point, but it also indicates that those women have been baptized as infants by the apostles, not as adults. But I digress. Another philosopher, you know, St. Just Martyr was writing in the 140s, <clears throat> about 60 years later, another great saint, St. Clement of Alexandria, wrote, um, a book called the Stromata. And in the Stromata, book one, section 1890, uh, paragraph one, says that the true philosophy has been communicated by the Son, that is Jesus. And so he also understood that philosophy is like the law of Moses. And it's an instruction that prepared for the Christian faith. That was his view of it, in that philosophy, therefore, could be used. And, and he also said uh, in the Stromata, uh, Book 1, uh, Chapter 16, that the Hellenic philosophy then, Hellenic means Greek, the Hellenic philosophy then, according to some, apprehended the truth accidentally. In other words, they stumbled on it. They apprehended the truth dimly and partially, as, as others will have it, was set a-going by the devil because they were started by their search to understand paganism and pagan deities. Several people suppose that certain powers descending from heaven inspired the whole of philosophy, but if the Hellenic philosophy comprehends not the whole extent of the truth, and besides is destitute of strength 
to perform the commandments of the Lord. Because, you know, they could tell you what something that you ought to do, but knowing what you should do doesn't give you the power to be good. And still, Greek philosophy prepares the way for the truly royal teaching, training in some way or other, and molding the character, and fitting him who believes in providence for the reception of the truth. So in other words, Greek philosophy is a good tool to help prepare you for the truth of Christ. And for Clement, Greek philosophy is not meant to bolster and complete Christian truth, okay? Rather, the, the task of philosophy is to defend the faith. Again, in the Stromata, uh, chapter, uh, book one, chapter five. Accordingly, before the advent of the Lord, philosophy was necessary to the Greeks for righteousness. And now it becomes conducive to piety, being a kind of preparatory training to those who attain to faith through demonstration. Philosophy, therefore, was a preparation, paving the way for him who is perfected in Christ. So that to you, in his mind, and he lived in Alexandria, a city that was very, very influential in this whole process of developing philosophy and teaching it. There are great schools of philosophy there. And he saw this as a uh, type of preparation. And he also uh, go, goes on to say, as we have long ago pointed out, what we propose as our subject is not the discipline which obtains in each sect. And by sect, he also meant school of philosophy. But that which is really philosophy, strictly systematic wisdom, which furnishes acquaintance with the things which pertain to life. So this wisdom then, which is, he defines as rectitude of soul and of reason, and purity of life. So rectitude of soul and reason means to think correctly and to have a purity of your life. That for St. Clement of Alexandria is the object of the desire of philosophy, which is kindly and lovingly disposed toward wisdom and does everything to attain it. Because wisdom is not the same as knowledge. Knowledge is knowing facts. Wisdom is being able to understand and know how to use the facts of life. That's a big difference. Now it goes on. Now those are called philosophers among us Christians who love wisdom because wisdom is the creator and teacher of all things. That is the knowledge or the Son of God. That, for Clement, is true wisdom, knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, then he goes on to explain how philosophy is there to defend the faith. Again, in the Stromata, Book 1, Chapter 20, Paragraph 100. But the teaching, which is according to the Savior, Jesus, is complete in itself and without defect. Why? Is there no defect in the gospel? Because it is the power and wisdom of God. And the Hellenic philosophy does not, by its approach, make the truth more powerful. So that's, that's a key line. Philosophy does not make the truth more powerful powerful, doesn't have a power to change your life for the better, but rendering powerless the assault of sophistry against it and frustrating the treacherous plots laid against the truth 
is said to be the proper fence and wall of the vineyard. So that, what does he mean by sophistry? So you have to keep in mind, he's playing with the Greek word for philosophy and wisdom. Wisdom is Sophia. Sophistry is false wisdom. This is what I like to call Bugs Bunny philosophy, in which they try to get you to accept something that is not true, but on a certain level say, well, maybe it could be true. And again, one of the easiest sophistries that people use today is that religion is the biggest cause of war in history, right? Heard that, right? And in fact, 2.3 million people died in the religious wars of Christianity over the last 2,000 years. That's terrible. We don't commend that. However, what the atheists failed to say is that 305 million people died in the past 100 years of secular and atheistic governments, and the atheists were way more violent than the other non-Christian secular governments. So, tell me who's dangerous. See, that's sophistry. I hear it all the time. And it's not true. 2.3 million versus 305 million. And again, don't believe me on those figures. Go to hawaii.edu slash powerkills. That's from the University of Hawaii, a secular university. But they compiled the figures. So um, this is something we have to pay attention to. In all sorts of other sophistries that come up, philosophy helps us work our way through them to see the illogic of the sophists. Now we begin paragraph 39. So it is clear from history then that Christian thinkers were critical in adopting philosophical thought. They used philosophy, but not everything and anything that came from philosophers. Again, generally not accepting much from the Epicureans, a little more from the, from the um, uh, Stoics, and then even more from the Platonists, and then later on Aristotelians. Among the early examples of this, Origen, the priest from Alexandria, is certainly outstanding. He countered the attacks launched by a philosopher named Celsus. We talked about him a few minutes ago. Origen uses Platonic philosophy to shape his argument and to mount his reply. Because Celsus was a Platonic philosopher, so he uses his own tools. That's always a good technique. Use their information against them to show that they're not logical enough. Origen assumed many elements of Platonic thought, and he constructed an early form of Christian theology. In fact, the name theology itself, together with the idea of theology as rational discourse about God, that's what theology means. Logos means thought or reason. Theos means God. So theology is lo logical thinking about God, rational thought about God. Theology, up to that point, had been tied to its origins in Greek. And in Ar Aristotle's philosophy, for example, the name signified the noblest part and true summit of philosophical discourse. That's the high, that's the goal, to think about God rationally, was the high point for Aristotle, who, even though he's writing more than 300 years before Christ, saw that God is the most important topic for any human being to understand, and is the high point of philosophy. But in the light of Christian revelation, what it signified a generic doctrine about the gods of paganism 
now assumed a whole new meaning about the one true God. And Aristotle was on, you know, uh, going in that direction and believing in only one God. He was well on that way. And uh, instead of all the different gods, because he began to understand they were just part of a nature religion. And that Christianity gave a reflection undertaken by the uh, believer in order to express the true doctrine about God. That's what philosophy was for. And you could use the tools of philosophy, but theology was to help you know the true doctrine about God. And as theology developed, this new Christian thought made use of philosophy, but at the same time tended to distinguish itself clearly from philosophy, it knew what we're doing about God is using tools from philosophy, but God and revelation and scripture is the basis. And it's just like you and I distinguish between your toolkit and your automobile. The toolkit exists for the sake of the car. You don't buy a car so you can make your tools useful. That would be silly. So, um, so also here, um, they made use of philosophy and distinguished theology from philosophy. And history shows how the thought of Plato, Platonic thought, that was used by theology itself underwent profound changes, especially with concepts of the immortality of the soul. Plato's idea that the soul travels from one body to another was rejected because we believe in the integrity of the whole person as body and soul. And the soul is only for one individual human being and doesn't travel around. So that was a great purification. And also dealt with the divinization of man and differences about the origin of evil because theology could understand the nature of evil better. But we'll be talking more about that in future programs. We need to take a break now, and we'll come back and try to get some of your questions and questions from our studio audience. So please stay with us. to have you come here and visit us. If you can make a pilgrimage to EWTN, please contact our pilgrimage department, 205-271-2966, or go to www.ewtn.com. They'll give you all kinds of information about the programs that are available for you to come and be in the audience, times of masses, and uh, the tours, uh, instructions on how to get up to Hansville to be able to pray with the sisters, all of that. So do come and join us. Also, I uh, want to remind you that, um, of course, I'll be in the Holy Land over Christmas, but uh, you can still get my new book, The Holy Land, An Armchair Pilgrimage. Uh, this has uh, a lot of pictures, of the Holy Land, as well as a number of um, uh, you know, episodes in which I go through the sites and the Bible passages there. And to help you uh, in another way with your learning of the scripture, take a look at this uh, dramatized audio Bible. We have the New Testament. It is a full cast uh, performance of the Catholic edition of the Revised Standard Version, and you can also get that at EWTN's religious catalog. Um, 
great, great thing to listen to when you're driving and other activities. Um, and you can get both of those by going to EWTNReligiousCatalog.com or call them 1-800-854-6316. And those make some wonderful Christmas uh, presents. All right. We have a caller. Hello, Brett. Brett, are you there? Oh, there he is. You know. Hey, Brett, where are you calling yeah. from? Um, I'm calling from Missouri, Father Mitch. Great, great. And, and what's your I question? Have, well, um, this last weekend, uh, Raymond Arroyo had a bishop guest on talking about uh, the Pope's new encyclical, and he mentioned that it was a programmatic document. And up until that moment, I thought I understood papal documents. <laughs> uh, they talk like a, the programmatic theme meant that it was, didn't, re, didn't rise to the highest level of teaching. And so I'm trying to figure out, I always thought encyclicals were right below like some sort of a major magisterial statement, okay. like a doctrine on the Immaculate Conception. And, and now right. I'm lost. As, well, as, Brett. What's going on? All right, Brett. Now. What did they call that document? Do you remember? Uh, it was the new one. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember. My brain just right. went dead. Right, but do you remember what they called it? I thought they said it was Pope Francis's encyclical. No, it's not an encyclical. Oh. See, that's, that's one of the, the keys. That's why he talked about this as, uh, I believe it was an apostolic exhortation. And that's where the, I'm lost. There's all the right, different right, right. That there, you know, that um, an apostolic exhortation is just that. It's not a def definition of doctrine, but it's an exhortation to do something, usually drawing on earlier doctrine. And he's not he's not trying to state some new teaching, but say, look here. He's exhorting the church to deal with certain issues that we have going on, and that is the, the role of, that Pope, Pope Francis has. Um, okay. And so we look at it to study it and say, okay, uh, for instance, one of the famous lines that has been misquoted, uh, where people are saying, oh, Pope Francis is promoting communism. <clears throat> Uh, that was from uh, uh, some of the news agencies, uh, not the document. What he did criticize was unbridled capitalism. Now, and say with something like that, you have to keep in mind, he is from Latin America. And in Latin America, you have a lot of unbridled everything. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, I, I, I don't know Argentina very well, but certainly when I was in Peru in the 70s, uh, there had been a reputation of big corporations from other countries coming into Peru, being able to bribe various officials, and that bribery was part of the budget for the corporations. And that would be unbridled, uh, you know, a kind of capitalism, where you're bribing officials to break the law to get what you want. And that's why later on, uh, it was after the 70s, that laws were enacted to prevent American companies from bribing. So that, that's a, a, a good law. You know, I'm not sure it always works. But, you know, that is one of the things that you, you, have, you try to do. Um, and it, should, it, it already is a law that you don't bribe officials in this country either. Uh, that goes on plenty of times. Speaking of which, we have a couple here from New Orleans. Um, <laughs> Ma'am, well, you're from New Orleans, right? Yes, we are from the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Great, yeah, it's a, it's a good place, but th there have been a few problems here and there over the years, have there not? Uh, <laughs> we won't, we'll, we'll pass over the rest in silence. Um, 
governors being elected while they're in prison. We'll just skip all that. Usually in Illinois, they wait for the governor to finish his term before they put him in prison. Uh, Y'all elected him before, you know, so it's different sty styles, but same result. So at any rate, <laughs> um, what is your question? Well, I'd like you to comment on the fact that, as you talked about finding the truth and mm -hmm. discerning the truth, mm -hmm. it seems that most Catholics today are overwhelmingly inundated with the Bugs Buddy philosophy, the media's spin on things, as you gave us an example. And finding the truth for Catholics, the, the true fundamentals of the Catholic Church, we may be losing sight of that. Either our generation has forgotten it, not passing it to the kids, and the kids maybe aren't even getting it. Could you comment about the challenge of today's Catholics to know the hard truths about the Catholic Church? Yes, yes. Uh, you have, <clears throat> in general, two kinds of issues. Um, one is a cultural issue of not communicating the facts of secular life, yet alone religious life. I was, uh, I saw on the internet a page that was photographed from a textbook for this new common core system. And it was a page about the Constitution. And in fact, it falsified what the Constitution actually said. It didn't give the actual words of the Constitution and then an explanation for kids, but it falsified it, made uh, the, both the First and Second Amendment different than what they are. So if they're not passing on the Constitution, we certainly can not expect them to understand much about religion. That's, that, that's just something basic. And this is one of the reasons why we have to encourage people to check the sources. Okay? Now, um, another point. You are somewhat younger than I, and Unfortunately, depending on where you were in the country, but in general, folks who received catechism from about 1968 and later received a watered down catechism as a generation. So what's, uh, there was a theory among the catechetical apparatchiks the, the, the people who did all that, that kids cannot make an act of faith. Therefore, don't teach them the facts of the faith. Give them a positive experience, make a collage, and have a good time in class, and then later on they want to stay part of this community. That was the, kind of the theory. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, but you, you, don't have, you don't have a microphone, but yeah, she, she basically agree, yes. That's exactly right. So here's um, uh, you know, one of the tasks that Mother Angelica has had with EWTN is to be a teaching network. We want to teach what the church actually has. And we not only do it on the programs, but as you've heard me say a number of times during the show, go get you know, St. Justin Martyr's uh, dialogue with Trifo, his first apology, his second apology, the Stromata by St. Clement of Alexandria. We have all of those documents online for free to download, plus more documents than most people can read in a lifetime so that you can know what the faith is. And uh, plus we teach on radio and TV. This is our task. And then for you as catechists to teach them, you know, it's true that a child does not have an adult level of faith, but they do have a child's level of faith, just as they don't have the responsibility of an adult to analyze a court case, how to choose a politician, 
or any of those things when they vote. But they have a child's understanding and you fill them with data. You let them know the names of the states, their capitals, the things about how they govern. Teach them all sorts of elements about being an American so that they know a real history. And then as they mature, they'll be able to make decisions as citizens that are better informed. Same thing is true with their faith. They will go through stages of understanding their faith, but you do what you can to teach them, and that's our task. Uh, again, the, perhaps besides the Bugs Bunny approach, another way to think it is, <clears throat> do we have the approach of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the truth? Or, as most of the culture has, the Pontius Pilate approach, cynically claiming what is truth as he stands in the presence of the one who is truth. That's the key difference. We have another caller. Hello, Mary Jane. Hello. Hi, where are you from? Uh, Massachusetts. Good to have you. And what's your question? Uh, I had a question about the uh, book of Revelation. Good. Uh, I have some friends that are Protestant, and mm -hmm. um, I asked the question uh, that the apologists always tell you to ask, um, where in the Bible does it say that the Bible is the only source of inspiration? Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they point to the uh, very, I think it's like the very last verse of the book, mm -hmm. where it says, don't add anything or subtract anything from this book. Right. Um, and I just wonder what your opinion of that was. Right. That's, that's what they use as an excuse for um, only using the Bible as, um, you know, their source. All right, now here's one of the things. I want you to think about this a second. Okay. When it says, do not add or subtract a word from this book, mm -hmm. did he even have the whole Bible yet? No. No, they didn't have No, because as a matter of fact, <clears throat> well, well, this was, <clears throat> Revelation was probably the last book written. But, okay. But it, the other books of the New Testament were not available to John because mm -hmm. Paul wrote his letters to different cities and they were scattered all around and they probably were not gathered together from until about 100 to 110 A.D., okay? And, right. then, uh, and then the whole Bible, the, the whole New Testament anyway, was not gathered together as a New Testament that we know with 27 books until 382 A.D., so when he said, don't add a word to this book, he means this book of Revelation. He's well, not talking about the I whole Bible. Too. He's talking about that book because he still wouldn't have known all the other books. So, yeah. uh, by, and, and in fact, the word Bible is from a Greek word, Biblia, which means books, not mm -hmm. book. So yeah. the Bible is that collection of books. And St. John simply said, don't add to my book or take away from it. Well, that's now, what I thought too. That, well, I use the force there, Mary Jane, and follow that. <laughs> All right? No, yeah, I think you're right. All right, let's now go to an email. Dear Father Paco, I live in Ontario, Canada. Last year, when the new mass changes came from Rome, our diocese also required us to stand after communion. I soon found out that we were the only diocese doing this. Many of us were and still are, are very unhappy about this. And just recently, I started to kneel again after receiving the Holy Eucharist. Do I need to obey this change that I believe is very wrong? It's from Virginia S. Well, Virginia, you know, I'm not uh, about to tell you to disobey your, your bishop, you know. Um, but here's what I would do. 
I would try to get in contact with the bishop's office of worship. Check into the chancery office and let them know that A, the general instruction of the Roman Missal does not tell us to stand after communion, doesn't forbid it either as far as I know, but doesn't instruct us, it leaves it open. Secondly, mention to them and get other people you know to inform them that this is not helping my devotion. I want to take time where I can kneel down and take time alone with my Lord. I need that choir, that quiet time. So this is something that I would very much, uh, you know, urge you to go to them and give them feedback, so that they say, oh, maybe we thought it was a good idea, but it really is not working out like we thought. Let's go along with the, the folks here on this. Try that, okay? And get other folks to do the same with your bishop. All right, we have another caller. Hello, Helen. Hello, Father Mitch. Hi, where are you calling from? From Mexicali, Baja California. In Baja California, hey, very nice place to be this time of year. <laughs> yes. What's your question? My question is, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and he says, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, take this bitter cup from me, uh, or let thy will be done, how do we know that he said those words if the apostles were asleep? Good, excellent question. One of the things, Helen, is that if you recall, our Lord spent a good deal of time with the apostles, you know, after the resurrection. And, you know, there was a good deal of reconciling going on there. For instance, when Peter is asked three times, do you love me? At a charcoal fire, when the only other charcoal fire ever mentioned in the Bible is the one when Peter denied Jesus. It's the only other charcoal fire. And so there's a reconciling there. And I have no doubt that the apostles were informed by our Lord about what he was praying when he was in the garden and letting them know while you were asleep, this is my prayer. So that would be one of the things. I think I have time for one more quick email. Uh, Father Mitch, did God turn away from Cain's sacrifice because it was not his best fruit given full heartedly or because it was not a bloody sacrifice of a lamb like that of Abel's? A person in my church says that the magisterium claims that it was because Cain did not share in Abel's sacrifice. However, I don't agree. Can you set us straight, Madeline? Madeline, you both have a problem proving your points. Namely, the text is silent about the reason. You can't say it's your position nor can your friend prove it's your friend's. We just don't know. It just is completely silent. And the, you know, when Cain's face is downcast, he says, why is your face downcast? Do what's right and resist evil, and you will be fine. That's all he had to do. But no, the real problem comes when he goes ahead and commits the first murder, and that is, is uh, the big sin. We don't even know that he did a sin. It just says he didn't accept it. So leave it at such. All right. Uh, I give you a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we want to remind you, that we can do this program and bring you all the other programs we have because you make this network possible. It is brought to you by you. 
So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And God willing, we will pay all of our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.